Uh, sepsis is called a silent kinger as it's a killer rather as it's responsible for tens of thousands of deaths in the UK each year. Yet it's so difficult to detect. Legendary BBC Radio 2 DJ Tony Blackburn knows how terrifying it can be after it almost took his life. And Tony's sharing his story as he meets two other survivors and discovers how research is underway to learn about the causes and life after this infection. I've been working in the entertainment industry now for over 60 years and I absolutely love it. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to the exciting new sound of Radio 1. Woke up one morning, have a sleep with all my blankets. But earlier this year, that all nearly came to an end when suddenly my health took a turn for the worst. I was touring the UK and developed a chest infection, but I was determined to push through. One day at home, I collapsed in the bathroom and couldn't get up. So my wife phoned for an ambulance and I was rushed to hospital. I was diagnosed with pneumonia, blood poisoning and sepsis, a condition where the body's response to an infection spirals out of control, injuring its own tissues. There are around a quarter of a million cases in the UK each year and 20% of those are fatal. 51-year-old former bodybuilder Mark Oakes from Essex is proof that sepsis can strike anyone. I was out once mountain biking I came home with three quite angry looking bites on my arm and then a couple of weeks later my arm just stopped moving one day and I went to bed that night with, with fever um, and breathless. Mark was admitted to hospital with an infection in his shoulder. So they operated on my shoulder to just take out the infection and then whilst I was anaesthetised my kidneys failed, my liver failed and my lungs filled with fluid. Due to the infection, Mark's body went into septic shock, the most severe stage of sepsis. He spent the next 10 days in ICU fighting for his life. I woke up in intensive care. I had a whole battery of machines next to me. I had lines in my neck. You know, I had oxygen on my mouth and nose. At the time, I just thought the surgery had gone wrong in some way. As Mark's health went downhill, doctors warned his wife and son, Lincoln, that he may not survive. They were very clear, very honest with her, and they said, you know, the infection is getting stronger quicker than he is. Did they tell you that? But I do remember asking the doctor, am I going to die from this? And he looked at me straight in the eyes and he said to me, you're not out of the woods yet. And I think that was probably the first time when I really realised just how poorly I yeah. was. Mark spent 20 days in total in hospital recovery. Well, the scary thing about this is that we didn't do anything wrong. You know, it was just bad luck. 100%, I completely agree with you. I don't drink. I've never smoked. My diet's good. I get plenty of sleep. All yeah. of these things feel like I'm ticking in the, yeah. you know, the, the good, the healthy box. Sepsis just doesn't discriminate. Mark hopes to make a full recovery with no lasting effects. But for Beth Budgeon from Hampshire, the impact of sepsis will stay with her for life. Last Christmas, her sepsis diagnosis resulted in a quadruple amputation. I had a pain in my side Christmas Eve, which was just getting worse, basically. I found out when I got to a &E that what I thought was a bit of a cold was actually flu and pneumonia. Beth developed sepsis as a result of her body trying to fight off pneumonia. The sepsis then led to septic shock, and the pain she felt in her side was her kidneys shutting down. So I had complete renal failure, respiratory failure. Boxing Day morning, they called my family and basically said that I'd had complete organ failure and to prepare for the worst. Beth spent eight days on life support and was put into an induced coma for six weeks as doctors treated the infection. But unfortunately, the sepsis had taken hold and caused tissue damage to her extremities. Coming out of a coma, looking at your own body and seeing that parts of them are inflamed and black and you know that that's not a good sign. Mm. And then you were told you had to have an amputation. What were the feelings there? Yeah, I mean, it's one of the most surreal moments of my life. Mm. If I'd have thought that having a pain in my side would end up in... Yeah. Loss of all four limbs in various guises, never in a million years. Beth had both legs amputated below the knee, as well as her right thumb and parts of her fingers from both hands. She spent the last couple of months in rehab, learning to walk again. 
I was very determined to try and have as normal life as I possibly can have, which obviously means, you know, legs over wheelchair, hopefully. So having to learn to walk again, having to adjust essentially to doing everything with one hand, it's a huge adjustment. I absolutely take this life over not having it at all. It's clear sepsis can have a major effect on people's lives and there is still so much research to be done to improve the outcome for patients. Sepsis Research Feet and the James Lind Alliance are running an online survey where patients, clinicians and carers can input any questions they have about sepsis and have their say on the future of sepsis research. Dr Andrew Conway Morris is an ICU consultant at Addenbrooke's Hospital. Andrew, sepsis is a very, very difficult thing to diagnose, isn't it? Why is that? Sepsis can often have quite subtle presentations and may not be immediately obvious. You know yourself and you know your loved ones best. And if something feels out of the ordinary, something feels unusual about the illness, it's always worth asking the question, could this be sepsis? The sort of things you want to look out for is, is the person becoming more confused? Do they have a, a very high fever? Do they have a blotchy rash or particularly the kind of non-blanching rash you know, where you roll the glass over it? And it's it's having that sort of trigger and saying, well, I'm concerned about my relative or about myself, you know, and I therefore need to go and seek expert medical advice as a matter of urgency. And I, I think that's the thing about sepsis is that it is an emergency. The time to effective therapy is, is really important um, in saving lives. I mean, on the way to hospital in the in the ambulance, I heard a medic say, oh, I think we've just got him in time. And uh, I mean, if it had been an, another day or probably, I probably wouldn't be here. So I feel very lucky. Thanks to the fast acting medical teams, Mark, Beth and I are still here. The best way to fight this silent killer is to seek help as soon as we can. And don't be afraid to ask the question, could this be sepsis? That is such a powerful film. I work with Tony at two radio stations. I had no idea that that's how bad he was mm. at the time. No wonder they call it the silent killer. Oh, I'm goodness so me. Tony, I'm so pleased that you're OK. Mm. Uh, Dr Poonam, it's really powerful film that we've just watched, but you experienced this as well, didn't yeah. you? Yeah, do you know, actually, that's made me really emotional, because um, I am a sepsis survivor. After the birth of my son 10 years ago, developed complications and I developed sepsis, which landed me in intensive care with multiple organ failure. And I completely and utterly echo everything that was said in the film and that sepsis doesn't discriminate and time is everything. So, you know, if you do connect with any of the symptoms or recognise them, get that help as soon as possible because it saves lives and the trauma as well is something that people don't talk about, it lives with you. I can see it still does. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah no, okay. thank you. It's tough to talk about it, but thank you very much. Act quickly. Can't stress yeah. that enough, can you? Uh, now, as it's 